Hello, welcome to the new ACTIC coach training. Uh, this training was originally given on September uh, 23rd, uh, 2021. Unfortunately, um, it uh, has become an annual tradition that I forget to record it. Um, so this is a uh, training that was taped later. Uh, thankfully, uh, I wrote down most of the questions people asked. And so um, I will try to address those as we go. So one of the first things that I typically ask people is what have they done? And so we did that. Um, and most of the people in the session uh, were pretty new uh, to ACT Act coaching, either literally they had no experience or that they were assistant coaches in the past who had had some experience, uh, but soon uh, uh, became head coach. Um, and so really this training is for people that have uh, very little kind of interaction with ACT Act so far, or uh, maybe we're just an assistant coach that are just kind of figuring out the full breadth of the job of, you know, being a head coach for academic decathlon. Uh, I have been a coach for ACTEC uh, since 20, uh, 2013, 2012, something uh, of that nature. Um, I have started out at uh, Richardson J.J. Pierce. Uh, coached there for four or five years and then began the academic decathlon program at Lebanon Trail when that school opened in Frisco. Um, was coached there for four years, uh, was small school state champion uh, one year, and now I am in Prosper ISD at Rock Hill High School uh, where we are uh, working to build a uh, academic decathlon program uh, there. Uh, I was recruited into a program at JJ Pierce uh, with the head coach retiring. And so I walked into a program that had many, many years of success, had some national championships um, back in the 80s and 90s, uh, who had gone to state for something like 35 years in a row, um, and kind of took on a team where all the, uh, the team members were seniors, so they all graduated. So essentially, I was starting from scratch from uh, day one. Uh, and then, then again, I, I, I did that at Lebanon Trail as well, starting out with uh, a high school where I only had freshmen. And so I, just, I had to build a team literally with freshmen and then sophomores. And eventually, after four years, I had you know freshmen through seniors uh, available to me. So uh, that is where I come from my experience. So those of you that are walking into a program where you had to kind of start from scratch and you had no kids, or maybe your school is just starting to do academic decathlon, uh, I've been there. I, I've had experience with that, and I know just you know how difficult uh, the task is that you've undertaken. And I'm so very glad you did, uh, because academic decathlon is a wonderful program. It is a program that I consistently advocate, regardless of what school district I'm in, um, and with anybody that'll listen, I'll talk about what it can do for young people. So let's start where, where to go for help. Um, if you have questions about rules or policies for ACT Act, uh, the best place, person to go for that is Rick, Rick Hopkins. Uh, Rick is the head of Texas Academic Decathlon. Uh, he's a great guy and um, will respond to your email very quickly. Uh, he, um, you know, runs the uh, state competition, obviously down in um, San Antonio, uh, the uh, other state competition in uh, Frisco. Uh, he's over that as well, but uh, it's a different person who runs that. Uh, but he can kind of give you uh, any kind of answers to um, rules, uh, how to do grades as far as determining eligibility, uh, any kind of uh, judgment you need called on whether something is included or not, uh, that would go through Rick. If you're looking for what is often a question um, that I get from new coaches is, okay, what do we typically do at region? How, what's that procedure like? Um, you know, what are the expectations on dress, dress code for kids at region? Uh, those kind of questions typically are best answered uh, through your regional competition coordinators because every region does their region a little differently. Uh, I have had the great fortune to be in region 10, 11, and 12. Uh, at various times in my coaching career. And I can say there, there are some similarities between the regions, but there are also quite a few differences in kind of the way things go. Uh, for instance, I've been in a region where the awards assembly was very kind of formal and, and kids were in their suits. And it was, you know, more of a, uh, a very uh, ceremonial type uh, event. And then I've been where the uh, 
uh, the or assembly is in a gym and everybody's kind of in their team t-shirts. And, and so really that's just going to depend on the region of what kind of procedures they um, do uh, for the actual individual competitions and awards and, and you know, uh, lunches and, and all those little things that kind of go into a regional competition. Now, for everything else, um, I strongly encourage you, if you're brand new to the program, to find yourself a coaching mentor, um, because there really are just a thousand little questions that you're not going to be sure about, um, how to do things, you know, how to kind of interact with you know, all the other coaches and the coordinators and, you know, ACTIC in general and kind of where to go for resources. Uh, those kind of things really would be helpful if you had somebody that you kind of developed a relationship with and could send a quick email and you know you'll get a good response back. Um, so hopefully maybe you have somebody in your district uh, who's also a coach or uh, someone in a high school close by that's also a coach that maybe you can interact with. If you don't know anyone really uh, in the program, uh, please feel comfortable emailing me. Um, I mentored plenty of new coaches. I'm, I'm happy to uh, be your point person, but I can also find uh, I know quite a few people in, around the state. I, I'm perfectly happy kind of giving you some names and people you can reach out to that I feel like would be very helpful to you that maybe are in your, in your region or in your area uh, so that you can get more of the local um, flavor of how things are done in your area. Obviously, if you're in North Texas, DFW area, um, I, I know quite a few more people in that area and, and can kind of help you make that contact. Um, it's also really nice to have a relationship and know someone once you get to region, and especially if you make it to state, that you can ask like, hey, everyone's saying this is, I don't understand what, what are we doing? And, and that's very helpful. Um, I was very lucky that when I took over as act tech coach, um, that I had as my assistant coach, someone who had been a, a head coach prior and she'd been involved with act tech for like 20 years, uh, Carol Hewitt. She's now over act tech uh, in Richardson ISD. Um, she was just a saving grace literally every day uh, for, again, those thousand little questions that you, you just don't even, can't even anticipate, but like, how do we do this? I'm like, oh, well, what's the expectation on this? And, and those kind of things. So uh, I really urge you um, to find somebody like that, uh, that you can go to and talk to and then, you know, commiserate with when, you know, things are going well, but also celebrate with when things are going well. Um, so. Uh, again, just reach out. I'll be happy to help you find someone like that if um, you don't know anyone kind of in your area. So I, I always include this picture because I just like bragging on my kids, um, you know, why we do this. I, again, like I said, I am a constant advocate for ACTEC um, because I've seen kind of the wonderful things it has done. Uh, these um, nine boys are probably the finest young men that I, I think I've ever known. I still have uh, dinner with them occasionally when they're home from college. They're all, you know, uh, sophomores in college now. Uh, they won the uh, small school state championship uh, several years ago. And I can't tell you what a benefit it is for kids at all levels, whether they be honors or varsity, they all take something really important away from this program. Uh, whether it's developing those interpersonal skills for our honors kids, really teaching them how to be uh, the speech interview masters that oftentimes, you know, they're really, really smart, but they don't know how to um, truly kind of engage with someone on a one-on-one -on -one level. Or those varsity kids who, you know, need help uh, you know, figuring out how they are smart and how they can express that uh, intelligence outside of a uh, typical classroom. So I've seen this program do wonders, uh, take really shy, soft-spoken kids and turn them into gregarious and charming speakers. Um, I, I really can't say enough about this program. So congrats to you on becoming part of something that can really uh, do a lot of good for your kids. So let's start with the basics. Um, it is a nine member team. Now you don't have to have the full nine, I'll get to why in a second, but uh, it's nine members, so three each. Honors, Scholastic and Varsity. Our honors kids are those kids with certain GPA and above. It's, it's usually your National Merit Scholars, or your all A kids. You've got your Scholastics, which are the kids kind of in the middle of grades. And then you've got the Varsity is those with a 3.0 or lower. Um, and so you need 
try to get three of each. Uh, I will tell you that my classes for ACT Deck, uh, and hopefully you have a class too. If you do not, it's still very possible to have a wonderful ACT Deck program. Um, I had to do it one year without a class, and it is a challenge, but it is very doable. Um, and so you'll, you'll hopefully have, I like to have somewhere in the neighborhood of 23 to 26, somewhere in that neighborhood on the study team. And then those, you know, 20 something kids study and they test and they compete trying to uh, make the final nine member team. Um, I like having that element of competition. It kind of pushes them higher. Uh, I also don't like it on the other end where there are just a ton of kids where some kids might feel like, oh, well, there's no way I'm making this, so why should I try? Um, there are schools that have, you know, two or three classes of academic decathlon, you know, there are 40, 50 kids, uh, and it works just great for them. That really is just a personal preference of mine. I like to keep it competitive, um, but large enough to where there is a competition, but not too large to where uh, kids feel like that they're not getting my attention or that they're not getting... Um, you know, a real shot. So uh, there are seven objective tests and three subjective events. The seven objective tests are math, science, art, music, social science, lit, and uh, economics. Uh, the three subjective are speech, essay, and interview. Now, all those 10 events for each kid, every score that they get adds up to your total team event. Everyone does everything. This isn't uh, like UIL or other things where you kind of get to specialize. All the kids um, are expected to do every single event. Now, what that means is that very often I have this kid that's like amazing at math and they can score a thousand on every math test I give them, but they don't do well on the kind of reading comprehension part, the, uh, you know, the stuff that's, you know, social studies, basically everything else. Uh, so they have trouble reading, retaining that. That kid, while great to have on the team, you know, for his math score, is not going to be the great greatest to have for the other uh, six things. And so very often, the, my amazing math kid that can do it with no problem, uh, even the more advanced stuff, it, it typically isn't the kid that makes the team. Uh, they the, Really, the focus is, you know, can you grasp the other stuff, the non-math stuff? Um, which does involve you know, having a pretty good reading level, um, being able to retain it, know how to study, and know how to apply what they've learned to the uh, test that they take. So something to keep in mind is you're kind of trying to figure out which kids to go to. We'll talk about recruiting here in just a second. Now, here's where I talk about you don't need the full nine. And I know a lot of new coaches, especially if it's a new program, have difficulty finding three honors, three scholastic, and three varsity. Usually you're short one place or another, uh, typically or often, um, especially if, you know, difficult here recently with grades not being really that low, tough finding varsities, right? And so all you need really to have a competitive team score is six. And the only reason that is, is because that only the top two scores count uh, for the team. So uh, for your honors, while you may have three honors, only the top two scores of the honors kids count towards your team score, not all three. So after competition or as the competition's going, um, it'll calculate, okay, who are your top two scoring honors kids? And, you know, let's say you have an honors kid that scores a 9,000, an honors kid that scores an 8,000, and an honors kid that scores 7,800. Well, the eight and the nine will count, the 7,800 won't. So towards your team score. Now, just because those two uh, kids counted for you on this round doesn't mean that they'll count for you on the next round. And that's why you have three uh, as kind of a backup in case, you know, something happens. Um, I've had a kid, you know, get sick at state. And so they weren't feeling well. And so they dropped down to be my third honors that didn't count. And my second honors, um, my well, you know, on the sheet is the third honors became the one that did count. So, and just FYI, it doesn't matter who you put on the sheet, one, two, three, it is whoever gets the two highest scores for honors, scholastic, and then the two for varsity. So those six scores add up to your total team score. Uh, someone asked uh, during the uh, session here, okay, what does that scoring look like? Well, uh, there are 10 total events. The top score for each event is 1,000 points. So if you do that math, it is 60,000. 
Um, so the top perfect score for an entire team over 10 events would be 60,000. Um, there are teams that have gotten, you know, somewhat close to that, uh, but obviously a perfect 60,000 from uh, uh, six kids at a competition is, a, it's a, would, I think, would be virtually impossible. Um, so, you know, what does a good honor score, a good scholastic score, a good varsity score look like? Um, really, that's going to depend on your team and whether you're small, medium, large, and it, it, a lot of things go into that. Um, if you want to be talked more through that of kind of what your expectations should be, again, feel free to reach out with me and I can talk about your specific situation and your, uh, you know, needs and kind of expectations for that. Because it's going to kind of depend on schools, um, you know, your client base, as far as like how many kids do you have in the, in the class and how much experience do they have? And it really just depends. Um, so moving on, uh, talking about eligibility. Um, what makes it honors, what makes us scholastic, and what makes the varsity? Well, there are the GPAs. Now, this year, 2021, um, the number of semesters that we're counting is different. Uh, for information on that, please see Rick and the information Rick has sent out about specifically uh, what semesters we're doing and how many you know, courses you have to have, because it's very different this year because of COVID. Typically, you were doing the two years prior to the year of competition. So this year is 2021, 2022. So typically you would look at the grades for your kids from the previous year, 2020, 2021, and the year prior to that, 2019, 2020. Assuming, there, you know, assuming the pandemic ever happened and those were just normal years. Um, so the most important thing and the, the question I often get, I got during the session as well is, you know, what about the grades, you know, during the year? Those do not affect their eligibility, whether they honor scholastic or varsity. Otherwise, their, their eligibility between category might change you know, three times in a year. So it's just the two years prior to that. Um, so for honors, they need to be a 3.8 to 4. That basically means an A student that might have a B here or there. Um, and typically with our honors kids, them having a B or something is, is not going to be an issue. In fact, if you have a really great honors kid who's a National Merit Scholar who has several Bs, it's actually probably a good thing. Uh, the joke I often make uh, with kids and other teachers is I'm the only person on campus that's rooting for my kids to, you know, get a little lower grade uh, because it really does help uh, with their who they're competing against. Um, you know, I've, I've had kids ask me, you know, well, I could get a learn like, no, don't do that. Get the grade you earn. Um, uh, but, you know, this is kind of where you will fall depending on what grade you have. Uh, Scholastic is 3.2 to 3.79. Uh, so those kids are going to be kids with A's, but quite a few B's. Uh, they're going to, you know, and, and generally you're looking for those these B's, and then when we get to varsities, you know, potentially a C, you're really looking for, really looking for those B's that are in uh, AP classes or really difficult classes. Um, you know, if they're getting C's in a, in a just a uh, base level academic class, uh, that might be a red flag. Um, maybe, maybe not. Um, and I'll talk to you kind of how I recruit and kind of what I'm looking at here in a second. Um, the sheet for figuring out uh, the spreadsheet that you use to kind of calculate uh, what the eligibility or what uh, their honors class or university, you can find that on um, the Act uh, Texas Active website. It's there. Uh, also, the list of courses that count because their GPA that you're calculating is not the GPA that the school calculates. The school calculates all the classes the kid takes, again, depending on your district. ACTIC only counts a certain number of classes. Um, it's generally the core classes and then certain electives, but not all electives. And so there is a course list sheet on there that will tell you um, which courses do count, which courses do not. Typically, if it's a performance type class, it doesn't count. So band, choir, orchestra, art production, those kind of things. But an art history would, because that's not about producing art. It's just learning about art history. Um, other than that, a lot of the other electives, it kind of gets you know difficult to sometimes understand. So don't feel like it's a big deal that you don't understand that right away or know those right away. I don't know them all either. I have always looked them up as well. So. Uh, that is something you'll just check every year. Now, the one thing I will tell you to do is check and retrack, check those transcripts and active course list at least twice. Um, 
I have screwed up on this and it was the last time I screwed up on it because I decided that was a terrible experience. Um, I calculated the GPA wrong and it meant that a kid that I had declared as a varsity uh, turned out to only be a scholastic and we did not figure that out until November, which meant that kid who felt like he was gonna make the team was suddenly thrust into a position where he probably wasn't going to. And in fact, he did not. And that made him feel bad. I felt terrible uh, for setting him up that way. Um, you know, essentially setting him up for failure. Um, and so from then on, uh, I now have basically a three check policy on these. I do them at the end of the year prior to competition year when grades are finalized. I check it then. Um, I do it again, you know, starting from scratch. I didn't look at the old piece of paper or the old spreadsheet. And then I check it again before school starts. And then my assistant coach who would fill out the paperwork would do the third check. Um, paperwork isn't due until December, but I would have my assistant coach do the paperwork in September uh, for basically everyone I felt like might have a chance of making the team for that year. And that way, uh, it was essentially a third check in September from a completely independent person who had seen my calculations from my spreadsheet. And so I feel like at that point, if it's come up the same every single time that I'm safe, that I'm not going to uh, mess up a kid's eligibility uh, or competition year that way. So I strongly urge you because I trust me, you do not want to have that feeling of first off feeling like you have a really strong varsity and then find out that they're a scholastic and also having to tell that kid that, you know, you screwed up. So please again, check and recheck your transcripts and spreadsheets to make sure that uh, you don't run into that same problem learn from my mistakes. Uh, I think it was my second year of coaching that I had to learn that. So at least I learned it early. Uh, and uh, now I've never had a problem after that. So uh, recruiting. Recruiting is probably the most important thing you'll do all year. Uh, I'll tell you a story. I had a couple of coaches who were looking for help to kind of figure out how to take their program from like you know, the level they were at, like that next level. And so they came over and sat in my classroom. And, you know, the first question I asked them was like, okay, how are you getting your kids? And they said, well, you know, it's whoever signs up for the class is, you know, who we have. And it's like, okay, there's, there's your first problem. Um, Act that kids are not going to find you generally on their own. I start really in December and I start with the PSAT scores. Um, you can get those from your counselor, Shouldn't be a big deal. Uh, it comes in an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, you have to delete a bunch of extra information that you don't need. All you need is kind of the reading score and the math score. It's all you need uh, and the kids' names. And then I sort them by highest total score. And sometimes I'll sort it by highest reading score because sometimes the math score, as I talked about earlier, that strong math kid is maybe not the kid I'm looking for. Um, sometimes I'll sort my reading score, see if that changes who's at the top because that may change who I'm going after. Um, so I start with PSAT scores and I start looking at the kids and by their PSAT score. And, you know, I'm going through and checking each, each kid's grades and looking for, yes, this is a somewhat time consuming uh, process and you will need access to kind of every kid's grades, um, which some districts are more helpful with than others. Um, one school district, I had complete access to look at whatever I wanted to. Another school district, I had to send a list to the to the registrar and she would basically send me their old report cards. Again, that created a lot of work for her, but I gave her a couple of gift cards every year and you know to make up for my extra requests. <laughs> Excuse me. And so I go through each of that line of PSA2 scores. Now, yeah, I'm looking for honors at this point and I'm looking for scholastics as well, uh, but I'm also specifically looking for varsities. What I'm looking for is the kid with the low grades, but who has a, a abnormally high PSAT like their PSAT score and their grade average doesn't match. Because typically if you have a high PSAT score, you had them an all A kid. And if you're in the middle of the road, you know, you're a BC kid. Um, and every now and then you'll find those kids who are like have a, you know, out of this world PSAT score, but they make C's and B's in AP classes. And that's a kid who's probably not trying real hard, but who's clearly intelligent, who has strong reading skills, who has strong analytical skills, who can take tests well, which, it's very helpful for acting. So that's what you're looking for on that uh, end. Um, one of the other places I go is failure lists. Um, I talk to my assistant principal and say, hey, can you give me a semester failing list? And I'm not looking for kids that are failing like lots of classes. What I'm looking for is that kid who's failed an AP class. Uh, maybe a particular hard one. Like at one school I was, it was AP World. 
um, and AP Physics were the two classes that gave kids fits. They were really challenging teachers. They were very strict and they were very rigorous. And so kids, you know, struggled with those classes. And so I would look for those and see if uh, that was a kid that perhaps could be an active kid at active varsity. Um, that was kind of back in the day when really you were looking for a C average kid for varsity. Now that you can't have a 3.0 or a B average, um, you may want to look for those kids who get Bs in all their AP classes, who try really hard. This is kind of where they're at. Um, and then the last and probably the most valuable um, resource you'll have is your own kids. Especially after you've done this a couple of years, ask your kids to bring you varsity, scholastic honors, people that they're in classes with. Uh, because those kids have probably the best understanding of what it means to be an act deck and what kids can and what kids cannot. Uh, often, before I even talk to varsity candidates, I would, you know, especially if they were kids who, like those boys that showed you earlier, uh, they've been an act deck for a couple of years, I'd throw names out of them and they go, yeah, no. Like they would tell me like, yeah, they're smart and everything else and they just don't try or no, they barely get by, they're really, they're trouble, they have other issues going up, whatever. And so that would be very helpful. Um, I've had kids bring me multiple times and, and quite often it's, it's almost every year, at least one varsity or scholastic that they know or friends with, they were talking about ACTEC and got them interested. And that has benefited me greatly. So encourage your kids to either give you names or bring you kids. I, I generally tell the kids, bring me the names so that I can check grades first before I start going to talk to a kid. Because often the kids sometimes have a feel that this person's a varsity, but then I check the grades and they're a scholastic or an honors. Um, so sometimes they're a little off and figure what other kids' grades are, but you know, more often than not, they might bring you a good one. So uh, use your kids as a valuable resource to find those other kids on campus who are looking for a place to be. Um, and as far as approaching the kids, I really have a different approach depending on if it's an honors, scholastic, or varsity. Uh, for honors kids, you know, I know what their kind of their mentality is. That they're thinking about college. And so I tell them, it's like, look, yeah, you've got a perfect GPA. Yes, you have an amazing high PSAT score and you'll probably have an amazing high SAT or ACT score. Great. Uh, so will everyone else that you're competing against for that spot at UT, uh, Berkeley, Stanford, um, you know, OE, wherever you're wanting to go. You need something that's going to set you apart. Right. And so I tell them, it's like, look, if in, you know, I've, I've, at that time, especially once I was living on a trail, I had kind of the results to prove this. And like, look, if you're the top honors in the state for 2020, there's only two other kids in the entire state who can make that claim as well. One large, one medium, one small school. And so that narrows it down to something that no other kid can put in. It's something to set yourself apart. Um, and it's using the talents that you already have being able to study, being able to retain information, being a good test taker, you know, being bright in general, being a good writer. So that's the attitude I've used for them. For varsities, kind of totally different thing. Uh, for varsities, especially if they really are a really smart kid, I approach them of, of telling them, look, I know you're smart. It's very clear you're smart. I have a bunch of data that says you're smart. But for whatever reason, your grades, and I always say for whatever reason, you know, I know the reason, you know the reason. Uh, but for whatever reason, your grades aren't showing that level of intelligence to universities. And so I tell them this is a way to do it and it not be a traditional academic setting. It's more of a team. It's more of a competitive setting to where you're just trying to win against other kids and you're being competitive. It, it's not just about getting a grade or it's not about you know just doing homework or doing those things that a lot of varsity kids struggle with. Um, for a variety of reasons. And so usually that's the tack I take with them. Um, and of course, for all of them, I promise food and I promise, you know, we get to go to state and then there's success and there's medals and stuff like that. That that kind of works with every kid, but especially the food thing. Food thing works often and I, I kept them well fed. Um, and, and so I would encourage you to do the same too. Uh, snacks are very helpful in keeping the kids focused. Now, as far as preparing your decathlete, okay, what do we do? I've got, I've got kids, great. Um, I have a class, I don't have a class, okay. Uh, how do I get them to do well? I, I know there's a guide and, and USAD puts out a guide uh, every year uh, for each subject. How do I get from the guide to doing well? Well, really there are two philosophies on this. Uh, the first is based on quizzing. 
And this is the one I've used. It, it's a method that I got from Rockwall and Highland Park and several other schools that did this who were very successful. And essentially the way this works is you give them a reading schedule of a certain number of pages you know, each night that they're to come prepared to the ACTIC class or the ACTIC meeting having already read. And then I give them the focus quizzes. Now the focus quizzes come from a company called DemiDeck. You can order them. Um, and they're targeted in on the questions over just a couple of pages. And I'll show you kind of what this looks like here in a minute. But essentially they walk into the class. I hand them the quizzes. They sit down and take them immediately. There's no time to study. You were supposed to do that the night before. And I hope I'm very close to that because that's the expectation, right? Um, it's just like in a sport, I expect you to spend time in the gym. I expect you to spend time working out. Same thing here. I expect you to spend time reading and studying so that you're prepared to actually execute when you come to practice. And so I'll give them the quizzes. They'll take them. Um, I'll tell you how many I do here in a minute. Um, and they will score them on their own. I don't score them myself. It's, it's an honor system. I spot check if I feel like there's an issue. Uh, but these aren't grades. They are just, how well are you doing? And so they score them. I'm usually circling around while they're scoring them, asking how they did doing occasional spot checking if I feel like a kid's being a little generous with this, you know, whether that's right or wrong. Um, and I've never really had an issue because what I tell them is, look, if you're going to do that, that's fine. But when we actually take a real test, you're going to crash and burn and everyone's going to know what you've done. And I also don't really come down on the hard if they have a bad day. I, they hear me say a thousand times a year, we don't live or die by one test. And so, you know, they score them. They record their scores. I input their scores into a spreadsheet. And then we spend the rest of practice either going back over quizzes if we felt like we crashed and burned on them, uh, hitting interview or some other topic, uh, giving them a chance to you know, get a little head on their reading if need be. Um, there are lots of different things we do with the rest of the period. Um, I, I do have block scheduling. So uh, we have an hour and a half. Quizzes usually take about 45 minutes-ish. And so they give about another 45 minutes to kind of prepare and do other things we need. Uh, so we'll go through the entire focus quizzes. And what I generally do is I pair two subjects together that have some kind of connection to each other. Uh, it kind of depends on the topic every year of what I pair. So like we may do three social studies um, focus quizzes, you know, from a section of the social studies guide and three science if they match well together. And so if they're making questions or making connections, excuse me, uh, between different guides. Uh, for instance, one year it was um, the Cold War. And so the history and the science, which was rocket science, which is going through a lot of the you know, NASA stuff and Sputnik and everything else were very closely related. And so what I did is I paired those together to kind of help them build off of each other. Um, and once I'm done with the guide, so like we're finished with the social studies guide, I'll give them a whole test, a, a full social studies test uh, like the uh, ones we'll see at competition and kind of see where we're at. Okay. Now, the other philosophy or method is that some coaches use is more of a teaching method. And this is where that you have kind of daily scheduled instruction over the guide for you're actively teaching them the guide. Um, and a lot of these coaches use workbooks or some kind of activity to kind of work them through much like you uh, would be if you were like teaching this as a course. Um, and of course, they use periodic testing as well. And that's kind of one of the common themes between there is that you, you kind of have to continually assess to figure out where they are, figure out what you need to go back over, what you need to have them practice more on, what you need to have them read more on. Um, and, and so that's really going to be essential to do that. Now, regardless, you need to do testing. You need to take them to practice meets if you if you possibly can, um, a scrimmage or set up your own scrimmage uh, if you'd like. Um, and you're going to need extra materials. And now, USAD provides materials. Uh, there is a company called DemiDeck, D-E-M-I-D-E-C, uh, that sells uh, academic Catholic materials. That's, that's the only one I'm aware of right now. There have been other companies, but they tend to kind of come and go. Uh, but DemiDeck's been around for a good long while. And the focus quizzes are what I order from DemiDeck because I feel like they're the most helpful at narrowing the kids down on specific um, material within the guides. So to kind of show you what my spreadsheet looks like that I, I kind of keep every day and these kids have all graduated. So I don't feel, you know, bad about showing their name and uh, their scores here. Uh, but you'll see that, you know, we, we 
SS1 stands for Social Studies 1, you see there at the top column, that was, or Social Studies 21, sorry, um, Social Studies 21. And so, there we go, um, 22, sorry. Social Studies 22 is the uh, focus quiz number 22 in the Social Studies Guide. And so they read those two or three pages. They came in the next day and they took a quiz over 22, 23, and 24. Um, and you see 25, I didn't have them do, uh, looks like I assigned them seven uh, focus quizzes to do. I only made them do six in the interest of time, but they don't know which one I'm gonna take off. So they have to read all of it. Um, I will go back at the end of the year uh, before we get to competition year and give them this one, have them go back and review over it. Um, just to kind of double check, make sure that's not an issue. Generally, the one I'll pull out is one that I feel like they're going to do fine on. It's not anything too complicated. And so you can see here, and you have in the folder I'm going to give you at the end, uh, a, a basically copy of this spreadsheet that you can kind of adjust to your own needs. But I keep each one of their scores. They fill out the score and I input it. You can see, you know, any weirdness. And I would know, okay, there's some funny business going on here. Um, you know, they might be cheating or something like that if I see a weird trend. Um, but I keep an average down here. I kind of see or how many of my kids were over the 800 mark. 800, I felt like that year was kind of the bare minimum. Um, you know, the, I set a varsity mark for like where I wanted varsities to be. And I had two kids over that. So, okay, so it was like I had 700 as my varsity mark. And then I keep the average for honors class and varsities. And I kind of, that gives me a lot of data to figure out, are we on the right path here? Are we on the right trend? Um, and so you can see that, that they're relatively consistent. Uh, this is the other reason I like keeping this much data is by the time we get to district, um, I, I can kind of go ahead and predict what their average district score is gonna be because it tends to not vary too much away from their average focus quiz score. Um, I, I rarely have had a kid that has overperformed uh, his data, you know, or really even underperformed his data unless, you know, something weird happened. So. I like keeping this much data. It really helps me figure out what I need to go back over once I get to the end of the year. Um, once we've finished all the focus quizzes, generally about the first part of November, uh, I know what I need to go over in November, December. Okay. Uh, if I get, uh, let's see, none of these look terrible, but occasionally I'll have one. Like probably this is the lowest one here, Social Studies 24. Um, you know, but if it was in the 600s or maybe a 500 average, then I know that that's a section they struggled with, I need to go back and, and that's kind of teaching 101, right? Uh, Reteaching the areas that they're having an issue with. And so for those areas where uh, they are struggling with, that is something where I might um, either do some kind of activity that would try to teach them that material a little bit easier or better, or I might have something where there's a peer uh, teaching uh, possibility going on, or just rereading that section and drilling down on it uh, might be helpful as well. So. Now, as far as what my schedule looks like for the year, um, we, we start, you know, I, I start recruiting in December, January, February. By March, I'm, you know, kind of narrowing down what the team will look like. And then by April, I've selected my study team, which is kind of the 20 something kids that, um, you know, will, will be in the, in the class the next year. And so the guides come out in May. And so I'll get the guides in their hands as, as soon as they come out, uh, whether it be electronic or a paper copy. I do still give my kids a paper copy of it because I think it's important to uh, read a paper copy that you can also annotate in and mark and highlight. I, I'm not a big fan of highlighting, but it's helpful for some kids. I really prefer they you know, write it with a pen or annotate it uh, as they go. And so what I do is I give them um, the guides for the summer, and I give them a schedule for either one or two reads of the guide. And a sample uh, schedule is in the folder that I'm going to give you at the end uh, that shows you kind of how you need to pace it out if you're going to read this once through in the summer. Now, most of my kids do one read. Um, occasionally, I'll have a kid who does basically one and a half reads. You know, they'll read everything once, and then they'll pick two or three guides uh, that'll do. You know, they'll do twice. Uh, they feel like they need to. Uh, I think I've only ever had a kid once do two reads of the guide, and that was, you know, my top honors who eventually became one of the highest scoring um, the athletes in the nation. Um, so really one read of the guide is fine. Um, and so by the time they come back to school in August, they read the guide once. 
you know, or close to once. So obviously my varsity is, you know, if I get 75% of it read from a varsity, I, I feel like I'm pretty good there, but I really like hit them hard with it really needs to be at least one full read of the guides and the novel as well. And so as soon as uh, they come back to school in August, actually usually before the first day of school, I'll give them a benchmark test. So I'll give them six tests. I usually don't do math. Sometimes I'll do it, but it kind of depends on where you think your math skill or math level is. Um, I'll give them a benchmark test. And this really is nothing other than me kind of seeing where the floor is for these kids. Obviously after this, we're gonna do quizzing. You're gonna read it again. So by the time I finish with the focus quizzes, everyone will now have read it twice. Um, we should never really be below that level um, on any of these tests. Uh, it also kind of tells me if I have a kid that read nothing. And, and that kid, I really need to have a conversation with about being in the class or not, whether they're gonna put forth the effort or not. Now, for a lot of you, that may not be an option that the kids you have or the kids you need, and you don't have the option to separate from that. Uh, a kid that may not be putting as much effort as, as you really want. Um, but hopefully you get to the point where you've got enough kids that where you can make sure that the kids that are with you are actually with you and they're they're pulling for the team and everyone and you're not, you know, having to keep somebody on who's not giving their all for this. And um, I, I think I've only once asked a kid to, you know, go ahead and change your schedule who I felt like just wasn't going to give me anything at all. Most of the time when this happens where they didn't read much of the guides over the summer, they crash a burn on the benchmark test. They realize that they're not going to be able to get through this just on their natural intelligence, that they're actually going to have to put a lot of work out. Um, a lot of times I actually get that work and it actually benefits them, it benefits the team. And so it's, it's you know, it, even if they don't do well in the benchmark test, sometimes that in a conversation with you about maybe this be, not being the best place for them can kick them into gear of actually getting down what needs to get done. So in August, once school starts, we'll, we'll start the focus quizzes. We focus quiz every single day. I will occasionally give them a day off um, where, you know, we just won't have focus, we won't have focus quizzes so they can take a breather. Uh, generally, I make sure that happens, you know, late September, uh, that's about the time they start, you know, getting a little tired um, and we'll do something else for that full day. Um, and then once we get to September, October, um, We'll be finishing out the uh, quizzes, but we'll also start speeches and perhaps a scrimmage. Uh, now the first scrimmage uh, that's out there is usually towards the end of October, middle to end of October. That's generally when scrimmages start. And once that uh, starts, um, there's usually, you know, one in October, one in November, and then sometimes one in December and generally December is kind of the end of scrimmages unless somebody has one early January. Uh, you can find scrimmage information on the Texas ACTEC website. Uh, Rick is good about posting the information for those where you can uh, figure out if there's one near you that you can attend. Typically they're $20 per kid um, and you can take as many kids as you like, uh, but it offers, and I really do recommend you do this because it does offer them a chance to uh, really see what the competition is like and, and to see kind of where their scores are falling with other kids. Um, even when I had great teams um, that were, you know, really doing well, I tried to find scrimmages where I knew that they were going to have a challenge. Like there was other teams there that were going to challenge them and really, uh, you know, kick their butts a little. And I felt like that's what they needed because often my kids would sometimes start feeling like, oh, we're doing great. You know, we're all scoring 900s or 850s, whatever. And then I take them to a competition where kids are scoring 950s. And then suddenly they remember that, yeah, there's, there's a competition coming in January and it's much tougher than each other. Um, now, when you start speeches, it's really going to kind of depend on when the first time your kids have to give their speech. I've been in a district that had a district competition in November that included speech. And so I started speeches in late September. And then I've been in a district that uh, had a district in December that didn't include speech and interview. And so I didn't really start speeches really until probably late October. Um, so that just kind of depends. I would suggest that whenever you kids first need a speech that you start at least two and a half months before that part uh, to get them to start brainstorming ideas. And we'll talk about speech here in just a second. Now, once we get uh, to November, this is when you really 
probably should try to find at least one scrimmage to go to in November, December. Uh, there's a few in October, but then there are a lot in November, December that you can find. Uh, this may also be when you have your district. Like I said, I've been in one district that had their district competition, also, by the way, known as round one. Someone asked that in the uh, meeting that, you know, what does round one mean? That's basically district. Um, I've been in, a, in a, uh, one district that had theirs in November before Thanksgiving, and I've been one that had it, you know, basically two weeks before Christmas break. So it really just kind of depends uh, on what school district you're in. If you do not have, if you're in a school district that doesn't have other ACTIC teams, and so you wouldn't have a district competition, um, there are scrimmages that are available in December that give that round one test uh, so that you can get that same experience that other people do. Um, district has really, unless you're, actual school district has a rule about this. District has no bearing on who gets to go to region, okay? That is purely district, really round one is, is more of a practice thing. Um, in Richardson, there were four high schools. We had districts. Really, the only thing that mattered was bragging rights and who got to carry the trophy home. And same thing in Frisco, there were 10 high schools or 11, excuse me. Um, and that's all that district meant. It was practice for everyone. And it really was just you know bragging rights and who got the trophy. Uh, it had no bearing on who went to region or anything like that. Uh, again, unless your school has some special rule or something like that. And I, I think there are a couple of school districts like that. Um, and so November, December, we're going to scrimmages. We're doing district. We're finishing the speeches, you know, making sure they're written and starting to memorize. And then, of course, in December, I'm picking my team. Now, December is also when you turn in the paperwork uh, to your region of who's going to be on your team. That doesn't mean that you can't change it later. In fact, I often, in fact, pretty much every year for the last five or six years, um, I have put nine on the paperwork, but I also have two alternates. And as far as the kids know, they have no idea who's on the paperwork. And I just tell them there's, you know, 11 of you left or 12 of you left. Um, you're competing until January, whatever it is, 4th, 5th, 7th, 8th, whatever, to see who my final nine is. They don't know who I put on the paperwork and it doesn't really matter because you can actually change that paperwork uh, up to 24 hours uh, before region. Uh, I would suggest going ahead and doing all their paperwork for all the 10, 11, 12 kids that you have, um, and at, including them as alternates on your paperwork. So it's a very easy switch uh, when you do it. Uh, don't try not to wait till 24 hours unless it's some emergency. Uh, but, you know, a week or so before that, once you know who the nine are, go ahead and submit that change. Um, nine times out of 10, I can usually predict who's going to be the nine. Uh, but every now and then I've had to like move a kid and, and you know, because somebody was just better. Uh, and so I'd like to keep that competition between those kids going as long as humanly possible, because that keeps them at the top of their game. So during Christmas break or during holiday break, um, I still meet with kids. Two weeks is a long time to go without your active kids right before region. I'm not practicing, rehearsing speeches, studying, et cetera. Usually I give them about a week and a half off. And so after um, the... Uh, January 1st, uh, after the new year, uh, we'll meet a couple of times before school starts to kind of get them back in gear before uh, school begins again that next week. So January, I'm polishing speeches, I'm working on interview, they're studying the areas that they feel like they're weak on. Um, looking at my da data, I may have decided that, okay, look, you guys really did not do well on uh, the second chapter of the social studies guide, the third chapter of the art guide, uh, the fourth section of the econ guide. These are the things we're going to focus on. These are the things I'm going to test you on. And so we'll focus in on that. And that's where that data really comes in handy in December and January, and sometimes even in February, of really identifying where your weakest areas are and fixing those. Um, and, and so that's very helpful. Uh, and then, of course, you have region in January. And you'll have a region meeting prior to the region competition where you'll go to the school or maybe this year it'll be virtual, um, where you'll get to just kind of see how things are gonna be done and you'll be able to ask questions and kind of meet some other people in your region. And I encourage you to do that because uh, it's very helpful. Uh, and then in February, it, you know, after region, we'll look at see, you know, what, what speeches did not play well, did not get good scores, why didn't they? Um, we'll look at the test scores for region that 
you know, weren't as, as good as we expected and start hitting those harder. And of course, state uh, is towards the end of February. Uh, if you make state, um, just kind of be aware of how that works. Um, you need to, that, that turnaround on paperwork is very quick. Um, and you'll also need to kind of make hotel reservations if you're needing to make hotel reservations for your state uh, very quickly uh, because, you know, everyone finds out usually that Monday where they're going to state and then the paperwork's due a few days later. And then you need to you know, set up travel pretty quickly because it's really just about a month turnaround from region uh, to state. And uh, because essays done online, it really means that from region, you finding out you made state about two weeks later, you'd be doing essay uh, for state um, since it's done ahead of time and online. So just be prepared for that. If you, if you are in a position of making state that the Monday after region is gonna be a busy day of kind of getting paperwork uh, taken care of. And that, that usually is the, one of the big questions I get from new coaches like, okay, am I gonna make state? Uh, it was the biggest question that was on my mind when I took over uh, JJ Pierce, uh, you know, more than a decade ago. Um, you know, my school has been to state for 30 something years and I don't want to be the one to screw this up. And you know, I was nervous all year about it and everything else. Well, I make it. And so what I did is this is pre-COVID numbers. That's the only thing I'll tell you. I went back and looked at, all right, what was the average minimum score to make state for either the, you know, the uh, Thomas Mosley state competition down in San Antonio or the other one in Frisco. Uh, basically, if you're a large school, if you're getting about 39,000 as your total team score, subjective, objective, or above, that you're in a pretty good position to make state. Uh, if you're a medium school, about 35,000 or better. And if you're a small school, a little wider range of scores, 29 to 31,000, that can fluctuate wildly because large and mediums tends to stay very consistent, small, you know, if a new high school opens like Lebanon Trail did, we were a small school for two years. They can kind of come in really quickly and they're really probably basically like a medium or large school, uh, but they're technically small. And so they may come in and pop the score up a little bit one year and then it falls back again next year. That, that's the other one's a little weird sometimes. Um, I know we kind of, when Lebanon Trail came in, it kind of upset the uh, average score a little bit and then, you know, kind of returned back to normal once we're out and then another new school opens up and it just can be weird that way. Uh, but generally, if you're in this range at region, you're at least in the running to potentially make state. Now, as far as coaching speech, um, this is sometimes one of the more difficult things for new coaches because you may not have a kind of a history with speech, uh, may not, you know, really have the kind of the fundamentals of how to coach this. Um, and so, uh, let me know if you need more specific help with this. I'd be happy to kind of kind of help walk you through the rubric for it and kind of let you understand what uh, judges are looking for and how to do um, help your kids do the best at speech. Uh, so as far as I mean, the first thing you need to work on with your kids is creating a topic, and it does not have to be related to the uh, topic of the year, water in this case for 2021, 2022, uh, in fact, it's probably best if it's not. My first thing I tell kids is that it needs to be personal and meaningful to you. Included in the folder I'm gonna give you access to has kind of my, I forget how many, but it's like nine or 10, uh, things to remember when you're kind of writing your speech that I give my kids. And one of the things I tell them is that if I can take your speech once it's written and give it to another kid, just some random kid, and have them give it, and they don't have to change anything about the speech, then it's really not a personal and meaningful speech to you. It needs to be a speech that only you could give. It's talking about things and sharing opinions and sharing experiences that literally only you could talk about and it makes sense. And so what that does is it kind of keeps them away from the saving the world type topics or the preachy topics of like, uh, had a kid once who wanted to give a speech on how, all adults should do more volunteer work and do more service because he had done a service project and it was meaningful to him. And that's great and might make a great speech, but essentially it turned into, it really wasn't about his experience. It was what, about how everyone else is failing humanity, essentially. And I, I tried to explain to the kid, it's like, you know, even the most well-meaning judge doesn't want to sit there for, you know, three and a half, four minutes being told that they're 
not doing what they're supposed to be doing as a human being. And so I try to get them to talk about their own personal experiences, their own, something that means things to them. And it's kind of the weird uh, nature of writing and speaking is that the more individualistic a speech or an essay or something gets, the more it's specifically about you, the more universal it really is. Because we all tend to try to find a connection to whatever someone is talking about. And so I, I try to get them, coach them through that idea, like just find something really meaningful to you that you really care about. And, and everyone else will kind of come along for the ride if it's well written. And so I also try to make sure, also remember that they know their audience. And typically these are gonna be judges that are, uh, you know, at least 30 probably. A lot of them are gonna be teachers. They may be retired. And so kind of think about that as you're doing, you know, your topics or choosing a topic is what is something that might be well received by them. And, and sometimes you don't know, and this is why you probably need to kind of not have the first time people hear a kid's speech other than you. Uh, be at region. I, I strongly urge you, if you can't find some kind of situation where uh, you are doing um, uh, a scrimmage with speech or a district with speech, that you maybe bring in other teachers or bring in parents to have them listen to kids' speeches and, and get the reaction to the topic and the argument and kind of what the kid is saying. Um, because what kids intend and what's received can sometimes be different. Um, you know, I had a kid one year who did a speech about, you know, monuments to our life and, and kind of wanting to create something to be remembered by. And without fail, um, you know, male judges loved the speech and female judges hated it. Um, and it really was about the way he was arguing and writing and talking and the way it just didn't connect with some people. And it connected great with other people. But the problem is that, you know, 50% of his judges were probably not going to connect with it. And so he had to rewrite his speech after district, you know, because we, we had, uh, even before district, we had showed it to people. Then after I showed it to some people and it just wasn't connecting with certain groups of people. And so he had to rewrite it. And so I really strongly urge you. It was, it was a perfectly fine speech. I thought it was great. Um, but a whole lot of people just kind of reacted to it poorly and didn't like it. And so, you know, it's, it's something to think about. Uh, I strongly urge you not to have your kid roll out their speech for a group for the very first time uh, at Region. Um, so the speech does, the prepared speech, the one that they're gonna write, memorize, practice, and polish, uh, that needs to be between three and a half and four minutes. Now, what will happen is, is that they'll be in the room, uh, they'll meet the judges, and I encourage them to, um, you know, in non-COVID times, introduce themselves and shake hands. Uh, obviously, shaking hands is probably out of the question, um, but introducing themselves to the judges is very helpful. Um, it kind of sets the tone for the session that your kid is professional and engaging and is having fun and being there. And so there's generally three judges, so I, I have them have three things in their head to say to the judges when they come in. You know, again, when we were shaking hands, it was, hello, thank you so much for being here, next judge. My name is, whatever their name is. And the third person was, you know, um, I'm so happy to be here. It's, it's, this is gonna be a lot of fun or something to that nature. So they have something to say to each judge other than, you know, hi, I'm, you know, Jared. Hi, I'm Jared, hi, I'm Jared. You know, they have kind of thought that out and it's very professional, especially for my kids that are not extroverts. And I get a whole lot of kids that are introverts. Um, that they kind of have to practice and train to be extroverts, right? And so that is good practice and, and it sets the tone for the both the speech and the interview, by the way, uh, that they are someone who's professional, that they have a good personality, that they're excited to be there, that they're having fun. And that, and I've been on this side of the, of the judging table as well, that really kind of puts you in a mindset of, wow, this kid's gonna be great. Now, whether that's, you know, should affect a judge's perception of your kid's speech? Yeah, no, I don't know, um, but it does. And I've seen it happen with other coaches, not just me. It really sets the tone, okay? So as far as timing goes, because someone asked about, you know, how does the timing work? Will they see a timer? Will they see a clock or whatever? Uh, there's a timer who's sitting in the room. So you have uh, the judges sitting in front of uh, the kid 
and there'll be a timer kind of just off to the side to where they're still in the kid's eye line, but they're not right in front of them. And they have three cards, one that says one minute, one that, that says 30 seconds, and one that says zero, 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 meaning no time is left. And so what will happen is as they get to the uh, three minute mark, they'll hold up a piece of paper that says one minute. And so your kid knows they have one minute left. Um, that's why it's also very helpful to make sure your kid's speech is very well timed, that they know the sentence they should be on when the one minute comes up. And so that way they're able to judge in their head like, ooh, I'm really ahead, I need to slow down a little bit. Or wait, I'm really behind, I need to either speed up a little bit or probably better just to leave a couple lines out uh, that are kind of, you know, I could leave out and it's not gonna be a big deal. Uh, and then at 30 seconds left, they'll hold up a sign that says 30 seconds left. And at that point, your kid should know, okay, I can stop now and I'm not gonna get a timing penalty because if your kid's speech is shorter than three and a half or longer than four, there's a timing penalty on the score. And so I drill it into my kid's head. It's like no timing penalties. I, I, I'd rather you stop your speech early before that zero, zero, zero comes up, meaning you don't have any time left or ad, ad lib something so that you're not under than to get a timing penalty because the timing penalty can be pretty severe. And so what they might, you know, get counted off a little bit for not being as smooth because they're ad living, it's, it's gonna be less than uh, some, you know, significant timing penalty. So uh, the other thing I will tell you is coach your kids to make sure that if they've gotten to the 30 seconds left thing, they need to stop pretty quickly because what often happens is, is that the timer's looking at the timer and especially once it gets down to like, you know, 10 seconds left, they're looking at that timer to know exactly when 0000, zero, zero, zero comes up, right? And so what happens is they're watching that and as soon as 000, zero, zero comes up, they're hitting that and then they're raising it. And so what that means is your kid's not gonna see that until it's already 000. zero, zero. And so, you know, and so I've gotten some kids who've gotten a timing penalty simply because, well, I stopped as soon as they put the 000, zero, zero up. Yeah, but on their clock, it was now already four minutes and five seconds. So as soon as they see the three and a half minute, they need to go ahead and wrap it up. They should be on their last sentence or two, no more than that. So really kind of coach them through that. Now, after the prepared speech, the judges will give them a sheet of paper that will have three impromptus on it. Uh, they can choose any of the three that they'd like. As soon as they hand them the three options, they will get one minute to prepare an impromptu speech. And that impromptu speech needs to be between one and a half and two minutes. Same thing with the cards. They'll hold it up and it has one minute, 30 seconds, and then zero, 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 meaning no time is left. Um, the impromptu topics, I've included a sample in the folder you can look at. They're general knowledge type things. They are not related to the theme. Uh, they could be literally about anything. I tell kids to pick whatever the thing that looks most doable to them is. I also tell them to stay away really from anything really heavily political, um, just because, you know, know your audience, right? And in this case, you don't know your audience, so you don't want to presume. And just to pick something quickly and not to sit there and go back and forth about what they want to do, because you really don't have one minute to figure it out. Uh, and so by the time you read those three topics, you're really kind of down about 45 minutes or 45 seconds. So I will share with you one strategy I give to the kids that I tell them, it's like, I don't really want you using this unless it's a, you know, break in case of emergency type of set, you know, setting where you got nothing and you're just trying to figure out, I, I've got, I need to talk about something for a minute and a half. So please do not use this as, oh, all my kids are, you know, going to do this. No, this is something to do in case all else has failed. It's emergency time. I got 15 seconds left and I got nothing. Um, one of the things I will tell them often to do is, um, you know, whatever the question is, let's say the question is, you know, I'll try to say some generic here. Um, what things in high school do you, or what things in school do you do that are truly meaningful? Okay. Um, my in case of emergency strategy is, all right, how would I have answered this question when I was six? How would I have answered this question now? And how would I answer this question when I'm an adult? And that really gives you three things to talk about on the same question. And if you think about it, if you could talk about 
25 to 30 seconds. You know, you got a little bit of an introduction. You got about 25, 30 seconds on each answer that puts you in the one and a half minute range. But again, that's just one strategy I use. And really I only tell them it's like, if you got nothing else and you were literally desperate can do that because you're probably not going to get real original scores on that one. And you're not going to get, um, you know, probably a lot of kudos for being just super inventive, but it's better than having nothing. So, you know, take that for what you will. Um, and so that's really, a, you know, the kind of the basics on speech. Uh, I think the most important thing is the speech topic and making sure that they're very clear on the timing issues and they're very well practiced. Uh, generally with the prepared speech, the very first thing, once it's written, I'm working on is memorization that they must have that memorized cold first. The second is gonna be staging where I really work with them to how to make sure their hand movements are purposeful. Um, to make sure that uh, their foot movements are purposeful, that they don't have any kind of tick. Um, I will often give them an impromptu to do at the very beginning of the year, just so I can see what each kid's tick is. Are they a swayer, meaning they're swaying back and forth while they're speaking? Are they a hand fidgeter? Are they a knee bouncer? You know, they're bouncing their knee the entire time. Uh, are they playing with their hair, you know, for whatever reason? And so that way I know what each time I'm with them, what tick to look out for or three ticks to look out for for some kids. Um, and that's very helpful as well. And so once they have it down verbatim, meaning they've got the memorization to T, they've got all their staging, hand movements, feet movements down perfectly. And by the way, I have them write their uh, speech, uh, excuse me, their foot and hand movements in on the speech so that when they're practicing, uh, they remember to do that every single time. Once I get to that point, then I work with them on coming, being more natural about the speech. So it doesn't feel over-practiced and memorized to get them to have a little fun with the speech, to vary things, to, you know, make sure they're putting something in, the, in themselves so it feels natural, doesn't feel just rehearsed. Um, and, and that's really probably the hardest part is going from, you know, I've memorized it, I know everything, and I can do exactly the same thing pretty much every single time to making it feel natural where the hand movements don't feel like something you practice is something you're just naturally doing. And so that's really that next level of coaching speech that you try to get them to. Now, as far as interview, a lot of the same things you're gonna work with the kids for speech, you're also working on the kids with interview. It's about body language, smiling, keeping eye contact with the judges at all times. Uh, it's that introduction of being, you know, seeming like an extrovert, even when they're not, you know, I'm not naturally an extrovert. It's something I have to work on. It's something I practice to where it seems like I enjoy, you know, speaking in front of other people and, and, you know, glad handing with everyone. It, it's, it's something you just kind of have to work on. And it's, it's, that's kind of one of the things I love about ACTEC is it does require that our kids that are introverts learn the skills of being an extrovert. Um, not sure if I could teach the extroverts how to be introverts, but I definitely can teach introverts how to be extroverts. Uh, as far as the answers go in the interview, the interview is a general um, interview about the kid. Um, they're not asking them anything about the theme or the guys or anything like that. They're asking them questions like, you know, what are you looking for in a college? Where do you see yourself in 20 years? Um, what's your favorite uh, hobby? Who's the greatest influence in your life other than your parents? These kind of questions that every kid should be prepared to answer. Now, this is something that you need to send your kids in cold because, well, it's about them so they can go in there and answer. No, these are questions that you need to practice with them a lot. Uh, I actually have them write down the answers to a bunch of interview questions first to get them to actually think on the page of what, you know, what is true, what sounds, you know, what, what sounds the best as true for me. Um, because some of these questions they may not have even thought about before, like what do they look for in a college? Well, if they're a sophomore or junior, they may only have kind of a very base level thought of what that is. And so I get them to think through that first. And then we practice the skill of delivering that answer in a way that is engaging, that's interesting, and it's unique to them. This is similar to that speech topic thing. Every answer that they give should not be able to be given by another kid without any change. And so I try to keep them away from generalities, being vague, um, talking about something that, you know, they've heard every kid in their class talk about, talking about something specific to them. 
And so that's something that really for a lot of kids is difficult. And it's something that requires a lot of practice. I also, you need to make sure that their answers are appropriate to the audience. Again, who the judges are gonna be. Typically over 30, a lot of teachers, a lot of retired people. And so I had a kid once who said, you know, what's your favorite movie? Their, their favorite movie was Taxi Driver. And it's like, okay, great movie, I'm sure, but I feel like that might not give the right feel. Do you have another favorite movie? And, you know, said, yeah, I, I really like, you know, and I forget what it is, but I just remember Taxi Driver. Uh, but it is like, okay, use that one. Okay, it's still your favorite movie, right? It's like, yeah, I love it. Like, okay, use that one because that one is probably more appropriate to the setting. And it's something that it was a movie, I remember, that most people had seen. And so they'll be able to connect with you on that. And then it's really about giving an answer beyond that, that initial answer that tells something about yourself why you like that movie, why you like that book. You know, that's that's an often question I'll give them is, you know, okay, what's your favorite book? Or what's the favorite thing you've read in the last year? And so, you know, most kids will say, you know, start with, oh, my favorite book is, you know, Harry Potter. It's a story about blah, blah, blah. Okay, look, they don't want a plot summary. They don't want the uh, Spark Notes guide to Harry Potter. What they want to know is why you like that, what it says about you that you like that. Where do you connect with the story? And so that's probably the most important thing about interview is getting the kids to connect themselves to whatever answer they're giving so that the judges learn something about them. So. Now, you'll see at the bottom, it says arena style interview. And I think of the speech when it's talked about group um, speech. And this is kind of the setup for uh, speech and interview. So if we'll take a look on the left there, you'll see arena style interview. And this is an interview setup that you may have uh, at your region and then at state. And this is where all your kids will go into the interview room at the exact same time. In fact, in some of the big arenas, it may be two teams at a time, uh, where there'll be nine tables set up, one for each of your kids, and there'll be three judges at each, hopefully, sometimes two. Um, and your kid will sit down at, that, at those judges facing them, and there'll be another uh, student with judges seven, eight, nine feet away. Now, I know the worry about this is distraction. Um, but generally, I've, I've never had kids come back to me and tell me, yeah, I was really distracting with a bunch of other people because they typically uh, focus in on uh, the judges and it really does require them to kind of focus in and kind of lean in and really listen. I also have them practice doing interview with each other where they're sitting about six feet away from each other. So they, they're used to other talking going on while they're listening to questions from a, a classmate and also giving their answers. And so it really teaches them to kind of block that out. Uh, as far as speech goes, this is what group speech looks like. Now, with group speech, uh, what that means is that five to six kids will all go into the speech room at the exact same time. And so you'll have three judges sitting behind a table and a timer off to the left or the right. And then you'll have the other students sitting off to the side while each kid gives their speech. And so they'll be listening to your kid giving speech. Now, this is great because your kid will actually be able to hear other speeches that are given. And it's really kind of nice for them um, to be able to learn from other kids, you know, what a kids, and especially, you know, I, what I hear back from most of my kids, it's like, you'll never believe what they're doing. It's all these things that are, you know, they know are wrong or like, hey, I, I saw him doing this. I know I do this. And I can't really, I can't believe that it's that distracting. It's like, yes, this is distracting as I've always told you it is. And so it's kind of a nice learning opportunity for them. Um, you know, again, you might think it might make the kids nervous. It actually generally reduces nerves in there because it's not just them and the judges in there. It's them and their peers and the judges, which does for a lot of kids help. Um, it's not a distraction. There's generally not an issue. I've never had a kid have an issue with this. Uh, it also ensures that we keep um, speech on time and we're able to run through uh, quite a few kids in fewer rooms. So this is what a lot of regions are doing and I know we're doing at state as well and at uh, nationals. So this is the kind of setup, again, your region will tell you kind of what setup they're doing, but I just kind of wanted you to be prepared when you hear that term arena interview or group speech, this is what we're talking about. Now, if you have any questions, um, this was during the period of question time, uh, most of those questions I've answered for you in the uh, uh, during the presentation day because I knew they came up uh, later. 
Um, but if you have any future other questions, you're more than welcome to reach out to me at jwstewart at prosperisd.net. Uh, you can also go to tinyurl.com slash acticcoach2021 to get a copy of this presentation, but also uh, all the sample materials that I've talked about. It's just a Google folder that you have access to. I would ask that you kind of make copies of that stuff and put it in your own Google folder because at some point I may decide to uh, delete or move that folder and I don't wanna want you not to have access to that. Uh, if for some reason that your district um, blocks tiny rail uh, links, please just email me and I'll send you a direct link to the Google folder. That's no big deal. I just didn't wanna put that big long address on here, something weird, something easy to remember was Act Tech Coach 2021. So. Again, if you have any questions, you need someone to connect with you with other people in the region, uh, anything really at all, please reach out to me. I'm happy to help you. Um, I, I do enjoy helping new active tech coaches to make sure that we're all as competitive as possible and the kids get the most out of the program. Again, thank you so much for watching this presentation. Uh, it's an absolute thrill to work with new coaches and I hope you have a wonderful competition year.